Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Invincible Season 2 Episode 3, titled Dismissive This Machination, a title taken from the crazy voiceover structural device of this episode, this episode being a chapter that really misdirects us into thinking that we can escape our demons, but really those demons are always there to beckon us back down. Let's break down this episode for all the Easter eggs, animation details, and deeper layers of meaning that you might have missed. And click the link in the description box to download Dragonair, check out the exclusive gift codes to redeem limited option gift packs, join D&D Legends, in Dragonair. So we open with Debbie dropping off Mark for his first day of college at Upstate U. She tells him that this is his chance to figure out who Mark Grayson really is. For most empty nesters dropping their kid off at college, that would be emotional enough. But imagine Debbie. She now has no one to rely on who understands her pain to help her process her grief. Even sadly, we see this episode therapy doesn't work for her. Now, I said this last episode, but I think the bond that Debbie and Mark share is what sets this universe's Mark apart from the others who sided with Omni-Man. Like maybe in other dimensions, Debbie's not around or she died and wasn't there to guide Mark when he was growing up. This is an episode all about relationships and it opens and closes with the two most formative ones for Mark. Debbie adds one last bit of advice that Mark not do drugs and he asks if they would even work on him. Later on when Mark and Amber have sex for the first time she asks him if he has super sperm or if he'll crush her while they're doing the deed. I love that the show asks all these meta superhero questions that we always debate with our friends. We've seen heroes like The Flash or Claire Bennett from the show Heroes be unable to get drunk because their metabolism or superhero healing power was also a debate had on She-Hulk with Jennifer Walters and Bruce Banner having to drink so much at that tiki bar and asking if Captain America could get drunk. So there's a good chance that drugs will not have an effect on Mark, but we will see if an immunity to drugs and other kinds of toxins is something that Cecil tests on him. In her car, Debbie wipes away tears and takes out that card that Olga gave her last episode. It has three dots, three dashes, and then three dots on the front, which is Morse code for SOS. Da -da -da. Da, 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 da. And on the back, it has this phone number, 1-800-555-0199, which is a fake number that's used in a lot of shows and movies like Rick and Morty, Spider-Man 3, and Tim and Eric Awesome Show. Fun fact, a phone number that begins with 555 isn't always a fake number. It only goes up to a certain range for the last four numbers. So Debbie calls this number and a woman answers who insists that they don't use last names, only first names. Later, we find out that this is because it's a phone number for a support group for spouses of superheroes. Run by this woman on the phone, Carol, voiced by Leah Thompson. I do find it interesting that she was so distracted at the beginning of the phone call. Later, she says it's because she has like a newborn, but I wonder if there's something else going on there. Mark's rooming with his best friend, Will, who's worried that Mark's seance dog poster and box of toys are too childish and will hurt his game. Seance dog is Mark's favorite comic, changed from science dog in the Invincible comics because of rights issues. It's about a Jack Russell Terrier who's a master at the metaphysical arts, and yeah, he's pretty much like a dog version of Doctor Strange. On Will's side of the room, perfectly placed, there's framed posters of Magnum Pi, which is a play on Magnum P.I. with Tom Selleck, the original Magnum Magnum P.I. and his signature Hawaiian shirt, and then DTF, which is probably a take on BTS, and Lil Boz X instead of Lil Nas X, and this looks like a parody of his Montero album cover, and Lady Yaya, a take on Lady Gaga. There's also a lovely throw rug, potted plants, succulents, and this has to be the best decorated dorm room in all of history. Marx's box of toys, oh, sorry, collectibles, includes a seance dog action figure, some robots, a giant eyeball creature that kind of looks like the Beholder from Futurama, and this army man who looks like Beach head from G.I. Joe, but it's probably just a generic green army guy. Mark gets self-conscious and throws this box away, but goes back for Seance Dog because that's his favorite. It's kind of like Woody from Toy Story. Those poor other toys, if they are sentient. In Amber's dorm room, she has a big X poster on her wall and a poster of a man singing, which looks like an homage to Nat King Cole. Amber and Mark decide to have sex for the first time, and Mark gets caught in his sweatshirt and she kisses him with half his face covered, kind of like Mary Jane kissing Spider-Man in the rain. So here, the episode does something amazing. It transitions from this to a narrative voice, the voice of Paul F. Tompkins doing a parody of old 1930s and 40s sci-fi radio shows like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. And so, dear audience, perhaps it's time to give Amber and Mark some privacy and turn our attention to the stars and a story that began generations ago in this missive, this machination. The narrator gives the backstory of Alan the Alien, who we met in season one, voiced by Seth Rogen. It expands on what Alan told Invincible about the Viltrumites destroying his planet, Unopa, as in you know <laughs> The Unopans were peaceful and highly advanced before the Viltrumites attacked. We see a younger Omni-Man taking part in the destruction. Specifically, he seems to be partnered with one other female Viltrumite, and I wonder if we'll get her backstory at some point. The Unopans blast at the Viltrumites, purple energy that kind of looks like the beam that the heroes tried to hit Omni-Man with in the premiere in that alternate universe. The Unopans rebelled and were defeated. Omni-Man rips this one's arms off, leaving just a head on the ground, looking kind of like Mark's one-eyed creature toy from earlier. One ship of Unopans escaped, kind of like baby Kal-El escaping Krypton before 
before it was destroyed. The Unopen survivors started breeding camps to replenish their population and make Unopens of enhanced strength to stand against the Vildramites. This caught the attention of Thetis, leader of the Coalition of Planets, who offered to let them join their ranks. The Vildramite campaign has become the scourge of the galaxy. Yes, that is legendary voice actor Peter Cullen as Thetis. Cullen is the voice of Optimus Prime from Transformers, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, and a bunch of other stuff. In an interview, Invincible creator Robert Kirkman said working with Cullen was a test of his professionalism because he was such a big fan of his. Kirkman said, quote, to say there were tears is embarrassing, but whatever, I'll say it. Optimus Prime, big part of my life, you know. I've been hearing Peter Cullen's voice since I was like seven years old. The narrator goes on to explain that Alan was the only successful Unopen experiment, but while he was strong, he wasn't strong enough to stand against a Viltrumite in combat. The program was deemed a failure, and instead, Alan was made a planetary evaluation officer sent from planet to planet to find fighters who could defeat him and maybe help defeat the Viltrumites. We get a play on the usual Invincible title. Because sometimes, to change the entire universe, you have to be... Yeah, instead slam cutting to Alan's logo. And then Alan heads back to the planet Telestria after a mission and gives these plugged in aliens his data log. They rib him a little about how he was able to find the right planet this time. In season one, we learn that Alan had confused Earth for Uroth and had been monitoring the wrong one for years. General Telia tells him that the Viltramites took over the planet Acreon while he was away. They had recently joined the coalition of planets, which has caused all the other planets who were thinking of joining to cut off communications out of fear. Thetis asks Alan what news he brings and sitting to his left is a humanoid lion who seems to be the same species as Battle Beast, who we saw in season one. Alan tells them all about Mark being invincible, half Viltrumite, and that he and Omni-Man fought, causing Omni-Man to leave Earth. Viltrumite against Viltrumite. That has not happened since the Great Purge. The Great Purge was the Viltrumite Civil War that Omni-Man told Mark about in Season 1. Everyone on the planet went to war with one another to weed out those deemed weak. Thetis pulls Alan aside to tell him he thinks there's a mole inside the Coalition, feeding info to the Viltrumites, and Alan offers to find out who it is. He flies back to his house, where he's greeted by his adorable alien cat-like creature, who has two buttholes instead of one. I like how they just display it with X's, and apparently that's okay to show, but not two bipeds having sex. And we find out that Alan and General Telly are dating, and the narrator gets squeamish as Telly as tentacles come out for some alien sex and he shifts his focus back to Mark and Amber who are also still going at it. So he tries to focus back to Alan's cat thing who promptly starts licking it booty holes. It's a great bit. Paul F. Tompkins plays it perfectly. And wait, are they uh, both booty holes or are they like a booty hole and another hole. I'm overthinking it. Alan and Telia go on a date and he eats these terrified looking worm things served to him by a waitress who looks like a humanoid chicken. As some of the worms try to flee the bowl, Alan shovels the rest into his mouth and Telia says she doesn't know how he can eat those. And we see that she is eating the brain of a creature who is still alive and stuffing the escaping worms into its own mouth. If you're a fan of fantasy, then you already know how well that genre works as a game. You get to be the one exploring, fighting, questing. It's the best. And one of the best fantasy experiences you can get right now is from Dragonair Silent Gods. Dragonair Silent Gods is an open world strategy RPG inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. With over 10 million downloads worldwide, no wonder Dragonair has secured the top spot in more than 10 regions since its global launch. And now Dragonair Silent Gods is introducing iconic Dungeons and Dragons characters like Drizzta Durgen and Ertu to the game on November 17th. And we'll have more iconic characters coming in upcoming seasonal releases. Drizzta and his Black Panther Guinevar will have a complete storyline for you to play through as well as plenty of open world exploration, enemies to fight, and treasure to find. Dragonair is now live on Windows, Mac, Steam, and Epic with compatibility on Android and iOS. Click the link in the description to download Dragonair today and use these gift codes to redeem limited option gift packs. Alan tells Telia that Thetis thinks there's a mole, but before he can give her any details, before we get to even see her reaction to that, he's dragged out to open space by a group of Viltrumites, who proceed to absolutely kick his ass when he won't give them any info on Invincible and Omni-Man. Telia watches in horror as they take turns beating him, and it's all set to this ethereal meditation-style music, which makes it even more horrible. At one point, one of the Viltrumites rips Alan's arm off and beats him with it. So we see where Omni-Man gets his fighting style from. It turns out Alan isn't dead, which is insane because we saw a woman literally punch through his stomach. Theta stops by his hospital room under the pretense of checking on him. And that's when we find out that he might be the mole in the bunch. He shuts off Alan's life support system and says, forgive me, Alan, can't wait to see more of this character and find out what his deal is. It's worth noting that the narrator wasn't around for any of this part. He seems to have tapped out after the sex scenes with so a stark contrast between the campy style of the beginning of Alan 
Bond story and the bloody loneliness at the end of it. But I still think the fact that we cut away from General Tellia so abruptly makes me wonder if she might have been the mole. I still could go either way, and maybe he killed Alan just to like spare him some greater pain, or he has some other plans with Alan. And now again, insanely from a structural standpoint, the credits start to roll, as if that part of the episode is over. But then we cut to Duplicate, working out in the gym. Things are still tense between her and Rex Blode after he found her in the shower with the Immortal. He calls her gross for going out with a guy who's over 2,000 years old. And she mentions that if you add up all the time she and her other duplicates have lived, she's probably the same age as the Immortal. And he's likely the only other person who has died as many times as she has. Which is interesting logic of how one person's separate traumas can all add up together in the amalgamation to equal another person's trauma. And that's one way they can connect with each other. Again, I'm probably just overthinking it, but I'm fascinated by this. Monster Girl, who's even younger now since she's been using her power so much, tells Rex that he just doesn't get it. And he says, what, are you going to knock my teeth out again? This is a reference to her wailing on him in season one when they were both auditioning to be part of the Guardians of the Globe. Shape Smith comes in and tries to act like a normal Earthling, but he has no idea how a treadmill works since they obviously don't have these on Mars. Rudy tries to map his brain to conquer the fear that he felt last fight, not realizing that fear is not the mind killer, Paul Atreides. Fear is actually something that we need. Fear is a biological instinct that helps us survive. He listens to Till Eunice Spiegel's Merry Pranks by Strauss and meditates. Monster Girl tells him fear exists for a reason and he shouldn't go down this road and he gets up the courage to ask her out to a movie. Debbie goes to a Spouses of Superheroes meeting at the community center and hears Theo sharing about how much she misses her partner. After the meeting, Debbie texts Mark. Several of her texts to him have gone unanswered. Good luck today. So proud of you. Did you have to fight William for the best bed? And then bet the cafeteria food doesn't compare to mine. This is clearly making her feel even more vulnerable and she types one day in college and you're too big to call me back. But then followed by three upside down smiley faces. She deletes that one and types call me when you have a chance and then deletes that and types, I miss you. Before she sends it, she runs into Theo, smoking by a cigar, who invites her out for a drink. Debbie deletes a text to Mark without sending it and takes Theo up on his offer, saying, I could use a drink. She's been drinking more and more since Nolan left. And I have to say, despite with Theo's apparently good intentions, I just don't think it's great for members of a, like a depression support group to go right to drinking drinks. Who am I to judge? But for Debbie, this is not a healthy step to take. Rudy tells Monster Girl that he's never been to a movie since, you know, he was floating in a tub of liquid and couldn't move his whole life. The movies on the marquee are Midnight Slaughter, Ritual Feline, Cobra's Alloy Cog, and Senior Loop. There are movie posters on the building, one that looks like an homage to La Femme Nikita and a Mr. and Mrs. Smith looking one, and a vampire film and a werewolf film. They tried to get in to see Midnight Slaughter, but since it's rated R, the ticket guy won't let them out without a parent's permission. And they do make a good point. Like, how does a parent sitting there make it any worse or better? Remember, Monster Girl is around 25 now, and Rudy is about 30. They both just look like kids. Monster Girl's used to this, though, and pays a woman 10 bucks to say that she's their mom. After the movie, Monster Girl makes Rudy eat a Burger Mart burger for the first time, and he comments on how unappetizing it looks, calling back the date that Alan and Telia went on earlier. Monster Girl makes a joke about how Rudy used to only eat food from his butt, and he says that that's not how it worked, and this totally reminded me of how America Chavez asked Doctor Strange and Wong if Spider-Man shot webs out of his butt in Multiverse of Madness. Rudy houses the burger and fries, and it's just fun to see a wholesome normal date between a girl who turns into a monster and a kid who used to inhabit a consciousness of a robot. Debbie and Theo chat and bond at a dive bar. Theo drinks the same beer that Eve created from the pine cones in her house, in episode two, and Debbie is just drinking something clear. It's probably gin on ice with a lime, no mixer for her. And she's a freak out when Theo tells her this. I wish I could tell you it gets easier, but Alana's been gone nearly a year and I still reach across the bed for her every morning. Alana, AKA the Green Ghost, was a photographer and member of the Guardians of the Globe that was killed by Omni-Man when he punched straight through her face in the series premiere. Theo calls him an alien psychopath and Debbie excuses herself to go cry. Later, Theo finds her in an alley and she tearfully confesses that Omni-Man is her husband. Although to her, he was just Nolan Grayson and Theo is unforgiving. He tells her not to come back to the group because it wouldn't be a safe place. And when Debbie says that she didn't know what kind of man her husband was, he tells her coldly, you should have before leaving. Debbie looks up at the stars with just despondence in her face and then walks down the middle of the abandoned street completely alone. The middle of a street doesn't care if a car hits her. Mark returns to his dorm room and Will instantly knows he had had sex with Amber. Will confesses that he's still messed up about what happened with Rick. We saw Rick get turned into a partially lobotomized cyborg in season one. Mark tells him that Cecil says he's been doing better and should be released in about a month. So I guess he was still being looked after at the Global Defense Agency for the past year. There's a knock at the door and Seance Dog is there asking for Mark. But since Seance Dog is a fictional character, Mark immediately goes into fight mode. It turns out it's just a bug creature looking for Mark's help to save his planet. He appeared as something Mark loved and 
order to disarm him, just like the alien did with Jodie Foster in Contact. This alien identifies himself as Nualzot from the planet Thraxa. In the comics, this is a planet where Nolan escaped to after leaving Earth. And comic spoiler alert, if you don't want to know more, skip to this time. Nolan married Andressa, a Thraxan, and had a son, Oliver, with her, who goes on to become the superhero Kid Omni-Man. It's interesting that Nualzot comes in as a form of Mark's childhood toy, making me wonder if this is something Nolan might have told him, like a memory that Nolan still had about his son, showing that there might still be a Terran soul somewhere in that psychopath's mind. Nualzot claims a meteor shower is destroying the planet, and Mark is their only hope. Mark doesn't want to go, but Will convinces him that he needs to go and help. We keep seeing the humans close to Mark, keeping him on a path of being a hero and preventing him from turning into his dad. Debbie, Will, Amber, they're all acting as Mark's conscience, reminding him what his responsibilities are. Kind of like Uncle Ben in Spider-Man. Mark defies Cecil's wishes and goes off with Nualzot to Thraxa, which is a gorgeous planet with these antennae looking structures. Nualzot says that the monarch wants to meet Mark at once, and we hear this kind of beautiful heavenly music, but there's even something creepy and off about this music. And we get the big reveal. Thrax's monarch is actually Mark's dad, Nolan, Omni-Man, who greets Mark with an outstretched hand telling him, hello son, it's been a while. And we end with a dolly zoom on Mark as he responds, dad? And I love how the animators actually made a dolly zoom in animation. Normally this effect is created practically by like zooming in on a subject while you pull back on the dolly or vice versa. And here they had to morph the dimensions of Mark's face in animation to make it look narrow and flat in frame to really underscore the drama of this reveal. So the words, it's been a while, are the title of episode four. And I cannot wait to see how Mark reacts to seeing his dad again after all this time. The fact that he's still manipulating Mark getting Nualzot to appeal to his sense of empathy to get him there instead of telling him the truth just doesn't give me confidence that he's actually changed all that much. Click the link in the description box to download Dragonair. Check out the exclusive gift codes to redeem limited option gift packs. Join a D&D Legends in Dragonair. Support us by grabbing a shirt from nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. Follow me on all socials at EA Boss. Big thanks to Gene Apolito for writing this breakdown. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.